Hello people, you are welcome to Product Masterclass. My name is Tola T.A. Alabi. And today's class, I'm going to kind of title When God Presents You a Blank Check. What do you do when God presents you a blank check? Now, um, now this, this class, the thought of this class kind of originated from um, my reflection on the life of a king in the Bible called Solomon. I know Solomon was was a very prominent king in the Bible. Um, His story is very familiar with people that are Christians, non-Christians alike. He was the son of David and he was regarded and is regarded as the wisest man that ever lived. And the story kind of says that um, shortly after he ascended the throne, when David died, God appeared to him and asked him to request anything. And um, Solomon told God that he wanted God to give him wisdom, discernment, the spirit of discernment. We might call it wisdom too. And... um, The Bible says that God was very impressed by his request for wisdom. And his reason for asking for wisdom was, you know, he was a young king at that point in time. And he asked God to give him wisdom and discernment so that he could rule the people well. So he could be a good king and serve the people well. And, and, And God told him, I asked you what you wanted and you didn't ask for wealth. You didn't ask for long life. You asked for a discerning mind so that you can be a good king. And God said he would give him a discerning mind and there will be no one before or after him that will be as wise as he is or as wise as God would make him. And um, God also said he would also add to him long life and um, wealth, tremendous wealth. And you know, when you read, you see, it sounds very good when you, when, you, when you read it at that point. It sounds very, very motivational, very inspiring that this young man who had God ask him to give him anything asked for one thing, which was discernment, which most young people then and even now would not think of asking for. That's very impressive. But then when you read on deep into the life of Solomon, it says he had a lot of wisdom and a lot of people came from far and wide to learn from him and he acquired a lot of wealth. But then he started to associate with people and um, that were not believers in God, that had strange beliefs and had contrary, you know, spiritual inclinations to what he believed in and um, he started to get married to some of them who were women and he said he had um, 700 wives, 300 concubines you know, 300 wives, 700 concubines but all together he had a thousand women that he was committed to or I don't know if I can use the word committed because I know I can commit to a thousand women. But a thousand women that he he had relationships with, romantic sexual relationships. And um, he said this drew Solomon's heart away from God because these women came with their own religious, spiritual beliefs and he started having to um, conform to some of their beliefs and build shrines and temples for their gods. And his heart was drawn away from God. And Solomon was in the Bible where was the king where the division of Israel came from. Um, because his heart was drawn away from God. And, and, and that really got me thinking. I started thinking, why would a man with wisdom not have enough wisdom not to evade those things that would draw his heart away? If he was the wisest man in the world, why was he suckered by a thousand women? Why, why, would he, why did he fall prey to that 
what seemed like an obvious scheme from the devil um, to reduce him by committing himself or having sexual relations with up to a thousand women. And I thought about it for a very long time and it, it kind of really bothered me. I said, well, I was thinking, is wisdom not enough? I mean, he asked God for something very honorable, which was wisdom. And then he ended up doing things that, when you look at it in hindsight, foolish. You don't have to look at it in hindsight. When you look at it in the context of the time, it was still foolish. And um, so it got me thinking and um, meditating and, you know, I, I got to understand something from this. That, you know, when God presents you a blank check, there are three things you can do. Three things that you can be motivated by in answering God. Number one thing is survival and selfishness. And unfortunately, this is what will motivate a lot of people when they're giving a blank check, you understand? If anybody had a genie and said, ask for three wishes, a lot of people would ask for things that are inspired by a sense of survival and a spirit of selfishness. So a lot of people will ask for what they want for themselves. So you have a lot of people ask for riches, ask for houses, ask for cars, ask for clothes, ask for beauty. You understand? We're going to, we're going to ask, for, ask for fame. We're going to ask for things to fill up our insecurity things for us that benefit us and us alone a lot of people will fall under the um the trap of survival and um selfishness you understand so we're going to ask for what we think will keep us alive so if we, oh i need a lot of money and a lot of food and a lot of clothes and a lot of houses so that, that survival mentality will make put us in, in a situation where we have to overcompensate, you understand? So somebody who feels, I need this thing to survive, is li likely going to take more than what they actually need. So a lot of people found that survival and selfishness. And I guess that's why God was so impressed with Solomon, because he, he was able to trans transcend that basic human trap for survival. It's an animalistic instinct. That's what animals do. They live every day to survive. And we need to be able to transcend that where every day, every action cannot be motivated by what will we eat? What will we, get, what will we gain? What's in it for me? We need to be able to transcend that. And I guess God was really impressed with Solomon because he was able to transcend that and he realized that a lot of people would have fallen trapped to that. Give me long life. And when you go to the church today, you listen to people's prayer requests, that's what it's all about. Money, possession, long life. Those things are good, but they can't become the core of our lives. And when God presents you a blank check, um, it will be a waste to ask for those things. So Solomon didn't fall for that trap. Survival and um, selfishness. The second thing that can motivate you to requesting something from God or when you're answering God, if God will ever give you a blank check to ask you what you want, is service and stewardship. And um, there are people out there in the world today that are motivated by a sense of service, a sense of stewardship. Um... And I guess that's where Solomon was. You understand? He really actually wanted to serve his people well. He wanted to be a good king. And that's a very noble thing. And there are people out there today that if God were to provide them with a blank check, what they would ask for will be the grace and strength and ability and mental focus um, and intellect to serve well in whatever capacity. I do believe that there are people out there who would not ask for stuff that is selfish. Um, because selfishness puts you at the center. 
So people that ask for selfish things put themselves at the center. People that ask for things that align with a sense of service and stewardship put others at the center. And so they will ask, um, you know what, help me to be able to build this company so that we can serve more people and make the country better and um, um, really um, meet up with the need of these people that are, that are um, needy. You understand? They would, they would not ask for things that is to their direct benefit. They would ask for the ability to serve and actually make the world a better place. And um, that's what Solomon did. And, and that's much higher than being selfish. It is uh, much nobler than um, being survival-minded. Um, it takes a lot of um, love for your kind to be asked what you want and to put others first and say, what I want is something that will benefit not just me, but on the larger scale, benefit other people. That's a great thing. And when you ask for wisdom to rule as a leader, it shows that you have a heart towards being a good steward. It's a heart towards um, stewardship. And that should always be commended. But you realize that that's not enough. Because the problem with stewardship and that being your request when you have a blank check is that stewardship, after a long time, when you are so focused on others, is that spirit of, I want to help others on a large scale, can build in you an insecurity. I've seen it. It's happened in my life. And I see it happen in a lot of people's lives, especially when you look at spiritual leaders, whether they are pastors or things like that. They start off saying, oh, we, we, we want to build a church. Do you understand? I want to raise a church of people that love God and can go out there and impact the world and have, do you understand, um, other smaller churches all over, the, all over the world. You understand? There are people like, like that. They have very noble plans at the beginning. When you ask them what they want is to help others. But then when others become your center... It's very easy for the opinion of others to derail you to. That's the biggest problem that people that are service-minded um, have. Because service is for others. So when others start to criticize, it begins to get to you. There's an insecurity. When others say, oh, you're not doing it well. Oh, this person is doing it better. The sense of envy that could come up towards that person that they now align with over you. That's the biggest problem with when your core or your center is in serving others. That's the biggest problem because people are fickle. That's the reality. They cannot be your core. If they are your core, they will derail you. And I guess that was the biggest problem Solomon had. The people were his core. And when he started to have the people all around him, it was the same people that were, that were surrounded, that were impressed by his level of leadership that drew his heart away. The same people that came to say, we are impressed by the way you rule. Teach us. We love the way you, 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 you love the level of wisdom you display. Those are the same people that came around and said, we want to get married to you. And then they drew his heart away. Because... He cared too much about their opinion. So when he married a woman that served a God that was different from his God, he, he wanted to please her at all costs. So she was like, I need to build a temple for my God. He couldn't afford to be criticized. Do you understand? That was the biggest problem of Solomon. The people pleasing. So he aimed to please all his 1,000 women. And that's the problem. And that's the problem when people are very... You see, you see people try to build very noble companies that really want to serve people and solve a problem. But then they get sucked in at a point that they think, I want to solve the problem and I want to be the only one to solve this problem. You understand? 
and 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 truth about it i'm going to talk about this in relation to business there's a level when you start doing business that some people you're seven will try to re-engineer your business and tell you how to do your business or criticize the way in which you're doing your business and if you do not have a firm heart or a clear direction in which you want to take your business you will cower to the criticism of your clients because they would always criticize you see it everywhere you see schools that start out with good standards great standards great standards of discipline education and after a while they attract a lot of people to the school influential people wealthy people and those people come within the school and start criticizing those standards and say oh you are too rigid with your discipline your style of education is not the way we expect it to be you guys should start introducing this to class you see if the school is is so carried away by the people coming in you would realize that a school that started with great standards would have those standards begin to fall over the years because of their insecurity about others so it's a noble thing to put others first but it's a dangerous thing to put others at the center of your life where their opinions matter so much and that was the problem solomon had so i thought okay i understand the problem solomon had and why wisdom was not enough because the wisdom was to be a good leader that was what was important to him even though it was higher than a mindset of survival and selfishness it was not the ultimate mindset the mindset of of service and stewardship is not the ultimate mindset the ultimate mindset is the mindset of surrender is the mindset of surrender and sacrifice and this is where you are not at the center people are not at the center god becomes your core and the center of your life and here what it means is when god does give you a blank check and ask you what you want the right answer the highest answer is i want what you want god that is what god wants us all to grow into we need to grow from infancy to maturity where you grow from oh i want this for myself or i want this so that i can do this for others to god i want this for you i want what you want i have no wish list anymore to me you are not santa anymore to me you are a guide whatever you want is higher than whatever i want and that is what i want so i don't want anything but what you want that's the highest mindset that's what we ought to aim for that is what god wants us to do with our lives to him to aim for higher so you see solomon asked for good but it wasn't the best the best answer would have been god i want what you want that's the difference between solomon as a king and christ as a king because when you read the bible christ always said i have not come to do my will but the will of the one who sent me your will be done a lot of times we 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 don't know the depth of what that means that sense of surrender i don't i don't know what i want i want what you want so i want you to give me what you want each and every day and i really believe that if christians and christianity matures to that level our prayer styles will change the reason we go to church would change the reason we read god's word would change the reason we do good will change it will be because god desires it from us not because we desire it as a means of getting something for ourselves that is the mentality 
that we ought to grow into. That mentality of surrender and sacrifice. It's a big struggle. For me personally, it's a big struggle. Because if I talk about my personal life, when I started designing, what I wanted was incredible. What I wanted was um, to be on the cover of Time magazine, to be inter interviewed on CNN. And now I think about it, why did I want it? Because I wanted a, a sense of importance to myself. I wanted to prove to the people I went to primary school with, secondary school, that I see, I wasn't doing well in school, but look at me now. That sense of pride, I wanted it for myself. That's what I wanted for a very long time. I wrote it in my book with my vision boarding. Do you understand? That's what I wanted. CNN Time Magazine on the cover. So I used to buy Time Magazine a lot. I just think I would be on that cover one day and then they would know. And then I grew from there. My understanding grew deeper and grew um, wider. And um, I started thinking, what do I really want? I don't want to be on Time Magazine. I don't want to be on CNN. That's not as important. And I started building my company and I started having people tell me, oh, your work is impacting my life. And um, when I watch your videos, it really helps me. And, and that really makes me feel, oh, I'm having an impact. And I just think, you know what? I want to build a company that will impact so, so, so amount of people. So I want to be like the most impactful company in Africa that will impact so, so, and so amount of people. I want to mentor over 200 designers who will go out to mentor another 200 designers. So I had a figure for what I wanted to achieve, but it was for greater impact. It seemed noble. For a long time, it seemed noble. But then what it, what it brought up in me was a sense of insecurity. Because every time I saw somebody with bigger impact, I didn't feel good about them. I thought they were taking my crowd. My crowd. You see, it's still, it's still anchored. When you dig deeper, that sense of service mm, and stewardship, a lot of times it's still anchored in, in insecurity about who you are and envy about what other people are. So, as noble as my stewardship and service seemed, when I cut off the leaves and I looked at the roots, they were still rooted in insecurity. So, my wanting to mentor over 200 people and then mentor 200 people and to be like one of the greatest mentors ever was because I wanted to be one of the greatest men. So I wanted people to talk about Tola Alabi. Oh, I learned from Tola Alabi. So there was always an insecurity when they were talking about other people. So I knew that I wasn't there yet. And now when I think about it, the other day my, my wife asked me the very, this very question. I said, Tola, what do you want? If God could do anything for you now, what would you ask for? And I paused for a long time. And she said, why is it taking you so long to answer? I mean, there are a lot of things we need now. <laughs> we need a new house, we need a new car, we need a deal. And I'm like, I don't know, to be honest with you. Because I know all these things would fill me up and make me happy. They wouldn't make me fulfilled. I, I know it. So the time I wanted a new car, I got it and it was, I was looking for the next high. So the time I wanted to get a particular number of followers, I got it looking for the next high. Particular number of subscribers looking for the next high. When I have people write me a message and tell me, yo, I'm very impacted by your podcast, by your video, by this thing you wrote, give it the next day, I'm looking for the next message telling me they were impacted. I said, I don't know. I just want to do what God wants of me. If it means nobody ever knows my name, but God is proud of me, I think I'll be happy, knowing God is happy with me. And that's what I try to get my mind into every single day. It's not about you, Tola. It has never been about you. You are a tool to do someone else's will. So you are a tool for the kingdom. You are not here to be a king. 
you are here to serve the king. So it's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's never been about you. It's about the one you're serving. And that's why when I read about John the Baptist in the Bible, see, the Bible says, no one was ever greater than John the Baptist that is born of a woman, that is born of natural birth, was ever greater. And I thought, why? But when you read the Bible, there's a part where, you know, John the Baptist was the man before Jesus came. He was the man that everybody went to to listen. He was rabbi number one. You understand? Spiritual guide number one. Then Jesus Christ came. And people started leaving him to go to Jesus, to listen and learn from Jesus. Even his disciples, John's disciples, left to be disciples of Jesus. And some people came to him. Some of the disciples said, look, look at this Jesus man. He's taking your people, your audience. He's taking them away. You're no longer man number one. You understand? You're not rabbi number one anymore. People are going to this man. They're leaving you. And John says something incredible. He says, that's the way it should be. He must increase and I must decrease. And I realized that's why John was regarded as the greatest person that ever lived, born of natural birth. The greatest person because he understood surrender. He wasn't carried away by the numbers. He said, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If that's what God wants, that is what God wants. And that's what must happen. It's not about the people. That are following me. It's about me just doing per time what God wants. So I guess the aim of this class is to get you to think. You might say, God doesn't, God has never offered me a blank check before, but I would have you know God offers you a blank check every single day you wake up. That's a blank check. God is asking you, what do you want me to do? Are you going to choose survival and selfishness? That's very animalistic and very basic. Are you going to choose stewardship and service? Are you going to be carried away by an activity and the impact the activity has, has on others? Now, that, that's very good, very noble. A lot of times, the world re rewards that. They give awards to people that, you know, awards, um, credit to people that build stuff for others. That's great. But it's not the best because you can't get sucked in into insecurity. If that's what's about building something of skill, of great impact to a large number of people, it's not. I'm sorry to say it's noble, but it's not the best. Are you going to choose surrender? And say, God, I don't know what I want. And even when I know what I want, I want what you want to supersede at all times what I want. Teach me to be able to give up what I want for what you want. Even when I like what I want more than what you want. That's the real answer to when God gives you a blank check. And I hope someone gets clarity from that today.